I am Laura Dixon, and you are listening to the Naturally Thin for Life podcast, episode number 192, Brenda's Story, Consistent Weight Loss at 52. Welcome to the Naturally Thin for Life podcast. I'm going to teach you how to get out of your diet brain so that you too can be naturally thin for life. No counting, restricting, or obsessing. I am going to take the mystery out of it for you so that you can become naturally thin starting today. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hello, friends. Welcome to this week's podcast episode. I have Naturally Thin for Life member Brenda with me today. And so in a minute, I'm going to dive right into our conversation so that you can hear her wisdom and her journey and really hear how much she has overcome, how much kind of programming from her childhood all the way on to her very recent kind of weight loss attempts that she has overcome in a very, very short period of time. And Brenda also shares how she is a caregiver, how she's gone through and going through perimenopause and menopause, and how she's had certain programming she learned when she was a kid about hunger and food and emotions, and really what she's learned about herself to be able to have consistent weight loss at 52 years old. And how much, especially I think as women, and she kind of shares her perspective as well, We learn as women that it gets really hard to lose weight as you get older, that when you're going through certain hormonal fluctuations, whether that be pregnancy or breastfeeding or perimenopause or menopause or postmenopause or beyond that, that it gets to be really, really hard and almost impossible to lose weight. And she shares something very interesting in her own journey about some of the misconceptions she believes that women have in regards to their body and hunger in particular when they're going through this phase of their life. So I cannot wait for you to hear Brenda's story, for you to be inspired by what she has to share, and for you to see truly how possible it is for you as well to live with the peace and the freedom that you've always wanted in your dream body. All right, let's dive in. Hello, friends. Today on the podcast, I have a Naturally Thin for Life member, Brenda, with us. And I am so excited to have you here. And I can't wait to hear more about your story, more about your your journey. So I'm just going to kick it over to you. Why don't you share a little bit with everyone a little about you and maybe some of your story leading up to Naturally Thin for Life and then what your experience has been. Oh, goodness. Thank you. And it is just so fun to be here. So, oh, my story. About five years ago, I'm 52. So I started down this path of what is the second half of my life going to look like? You know, I got my son out of high school and really started to dive into that I don't want to call it, you know, midlife crisis, but it was more a midlife scrutiny of what the first half looked like and what do I want the second half to look like. And I had a conversation with my grandmother, who I'm very fortunate she lived until she was 98. She just passed last year. And we were having a conversation and she, like many older people, she was not getting enough nutrition. She was quite thin. And I said, Grandma, you really got to, you know, drink the Ensure and you've got to, you know, because she had those Ensure drinks. And it was the only way we could successfully, it seemed like, get some nutrition in her. And she said, well, I just don't like drinking those because, you know, those are going to make me fat. And I paused and I thought, this woman is in her 90s. And I swear, if I have to live the second half of my life, and I'm in my 90s, and I'm concerned about being fat, like I was done, like I the, the mic dropped. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. I can't do this. So it really was just that epiphany moment. It's like, okay, so how do I fix this? How do I fix being a woman who was raised in the 70s and 80s? I was born in 71. So I, I remember my mom having tab diet drink. <laughs> that stuff still makes me shudder. You know, and and watching her do leg lifts on the floor and Jane Fonda workout videos and that whole like exercise more, starve more, deprive more, all of that stuff. And I'm like, how do I unpack all of this? And so I started down that journey and it's been a five-year journey. And then about two months ago, I was looking at something on Instagram and it was somebody I follow. She's like, she likes to do outdoor camping and outdoor women's adventures. 
and she had mentioned something about her weight and the struggle. And somebody commented and said, you should check out Laura Dixon's podcast and her content. It might be the mind shift that you need. And I was like, well, I'm going to go check that out. I don't know if anybody else is. So that's how I, I found you. And it flowed in extremely well with where the next phase of this journey was definitely the right one for me because, you know, I've done the diet restriction. I've done the macro counting, the Noom, the Weight Watchers. There isn't much I haven't done. And I've never been excessively overweight, meaning, you know, I've never, I've never been more than about 40 pounds above my, what I would consider my naturally thin or my ideal frame. That also comes with the fact that that 40 pounds, I would gain it, lose it, gain it, lose it, gain it, lose it. And I remember at one point, and I don't know if it was in a podcast or if it was in the the membership content, and it was about the fact of, you know, if it was as simple as more restriction, more working out, more dedication, like I am that type A person. If there was a way to do more, I'd have done more. And I tried and it just is that futile conversation in your own head, like, what what am I doing wrong? How can this be so hard, right? And then I listened to the content in the podcast and I was immediately like, this, this is definitely where I see my journey going and how I want to live the second half of my life. And so it has been about seven weeks now. I started just before the July 4th holiday weekend and Part of that journey is, so this is part of that process, right? Is last December, the weather was terrible here. I live in Northern Michigan. We didn't have enough snow for me to go cross country skiing and it's like freezing rain. And so I didn't want to go for a run. And of course, you know, got to get my exercise, got to burn the calories. And I did a free cardio kickboxing class, which was fun. However, I was, you know, I'm carrying a little bit of extra weight on my frame. I was a little bit undertrained when I went into it and I have an inability to check my ego at the door. So I went in there and did a full send on that thing and tore my meniscus in my left knee. And so just before the July 4th holiday, I saw the orthopedic surgeon and they gave me the results of the MRI after months of trying to like get this to fix itself. And they were like, no, we need to, you know, we need to go in there and just do a quick repair. It'll be really simple. And I'm like, well, you know, of course, my question is how long before I can exercise, right? And they're like, well, you know, four to eight weeks depends on the person and depends on really how much we have to do when we get in there. And then they said, it's really minor. So you should be okay. And then I thought, all right, if there's no time like the present to really take that next piece, that next step in my puzzle piece of how do I repair and start to live a more intentional life and get a better handle on my eating patterns, why I eat when I'm not hungry, all of those things. And I mean, and there's been stuff that I have uncovered in the depths of my brain as I've worked through the content that have just blown me away. And I've just sat there and went, oh my gosh, like, holy, like, wow, (laughs) those moments, right? So since I started the content, You know, I mean, the most I can do is walk. They just cleared me yesterday to be able to ride my bike again. And it'll be a few weeks before I can start to do some jogging. And I actually love to exercise. I absolutely love exercise. I love being very fit and active. I have done some amazing adventure, women's adventure type trips. So exercise for me is not a problem. A few years ago, I fixed that mental piece of using exercise to eat things that in my head, I was like, well, I can't have that unless I go run five miles. Or, you know, it's like, no, we can't go out to dinner until I make sure I've starved myself all day and run five miles. So that's where I'm at. And I have my workbook on my on my desk right in front of me. And, you know, I was looking to see like, where am I at? Right. It's like, it's been seven weeks and I'm not, I'm halfway through week four. And I've even skipped a couple that I was like, I'm not ready for that piece yet. The humiliation example piece, I'm not quite ready for yet. I'm going to go back to that. And I will say the other piece of all of this is I was raised in a very Midwestern German, like authoritarian type household. I really was never given that license to say, I don't want to eat that or I'm not hungry. 
or I don't want to do something or whatever that is like that was never part of my upbringing. And so now going, you know, to look back and say, well, did I ever have any natural like hunger signals or preferences? Like I've had people ask me, what are my favorite foods or what's my favorite dinner? And I don't because I was raised when it's dinner time, you sit down and eat and you eat what's in front of you and that's it. And like working my brain through this process of it is noon. Like if it was today, if it's noon, okay, it's time for lunch. Well, wait a minute. Am I even hungry? And if I'm not hungry, like, can I wait to eat? Will my work schedule, because I work full time and, you know, so can I shift my work schedule? Can I eat later? Can I, you know, what can I do? The breakfast piece is recognizing and acknowledging hunger signals for breakfast has been the one that has blown me away because I have always said, love breakfast, can't wait to eat breakfast. It's the best, whatever. I do love breakfast. What's been phenomenal has been me being like, I got to get ready. My first meeting is at X time. I got to get ready for work. I got to hurry up and eat breakfast. Am I hungry? Do I even have to eat breakfast right now? Can I take breakfast with me? Can I, you know, I, I don't know. So like, these are questions I've never been able to ask myself. So it's, been, it's been fascinating, you know, along with the fact of, because having been, you know, as someone who has counted calories for way too many years of my life to the point of, I never want to count a single calorie ever again. I don't ever even want to, I just don't even want to look at a label right now. You know, is that thought of when I sit down to dinner or I sit down to any meal and I look at a portion size and, you know, in my, my diet brain is like, well, that's X number of ounces, which equates to X number of protein. So I need to eat all of that. Who says I need to eat all of that? You know, I, I, your voice is in my head and it's going, really? Who takes license to control your brain? I was just, I was just listening to a piece while I walked the dogs this morning and the conversation was about, you know, if you have to get up and go to the bathroom in the morning, is there somebody in your brain telling you it's okay to go to the bathroom or you need to go? It's like, no, your brain just knows. So why did I give over all of that license, you know, for my nutrition, for my health, for my vitality, just my longevity? Why did I give over all that license and those decision-making powers to like the diet industry, part of it makes me insane. Like I get visceral anger over the fact that I turned that over because I am someone that really likes, I'm at that phase in my life. And many women over 50 can, can attest to this is like, no more bull crap. I'm done. Like, <laughs> yeah, get out. <laughs> so. Yeah. It is like in hindsight too. And I don't spend a ton of time thinking about it because it does make me very angry. Where it's almost like as a society, we've just all taken on these kind of lies, like the most predominant one being that someone else knows better than you when, what, and how much to eat. And when you like yeah. really, really sit with it and think about it, it's completely insane. Yeah. Like it, it just it, doesn't make any sense at all. I know. And that's that piece has been one of those pieces where it really woke me up and it really made me start to think about you know, what that continual reminder from you, which is what really makes you feel good in your body. And it's funny, but you're in other like episodes, you reference a specific pizza. And I have always said one of my favorite meals is pizza. But then I started down this naturally thin journey and realized pizza, pizza is not good for me. <laughs> like the dairy, like no nope, bloated, gassy, uncomfortable, lethargic, you know, all of those things. I love the taste of it right now. I may not in the future, but for right now, I still love the taste of it. But then I'm like, no, that's just not a good idea. And now it's like, okay, so what do we do for our Friday night, like date night? Cause we would always like do like a pizzeria pizza. And, you know, so it's like, okay, well, we'll find something else. But for right now, it's just an amazing journey. It really is. Yeah. And I was thinking about this recently. We have near where we live. So you're in Michigan. We live in Wisconsin. And they have this historic kind of re 
not reinvention, but like a where you can go, they call it Old World Wisconsin, and you can go and see how people used to live in the mid like 1800s up to the early 1900s. And I was just thinking about it as we were going through, and there are like kind of like actors and actresses there, like playing out different roles. And I was just thinking about just meals and how it made sense then when people were literally using their bodies all day, every day to have like breakfast, lunch and dinner. Like you probably needed that energy to, you know, go either farm or, you know, like do laundry on a washboard all day with like whatever you're like, whatever you're doing. And, yeah. And so we're there and I'm like, whoa, I'm so glad I live now, <laughs> by the way. So it, it makes sense. And then, you know, I think back to like my grandma lived till she was 99. And I rem- like I remember her drinking Diet Right. And I remember, you know, all the different, you know, little things that, you know, she would do. And I remember, you know, watching Oprah and all the weight loss experts that would come on. And I think, you know, it can be helpful to be like, oh, it made sense potentially to eat breakfast, lunch and dinner when you were working all day. And like for our grandparents, you know, they lived through times where there was like true, genuine food scarcity, both in resources and availability of food. But it's kind of like, well, now a lot of us are fortunate enough that we don't live in that situation where we are laboring all day and we need all that energy and or that we have an abundance of food. And I just feel like it's very maybe different than how other generations were used to. And so then we find ourselves being like, it's almost like, okay, how do I have breakfast, lunch, and dinner? I need all the meals I want to eat. And you know, still lose weight. So people have put themselves in this like catch 22 that just can't really work when you want to have that just feeling really good in your body and that that ease and that freedom. So I'm curious when you were talking, when you go back to the time when you were saying, you know, I was trying these things and I was counting and I was, you know, counting calories and tracking my macros and you were questioning like, what's wrong with me? Like, why is this so hard? Do you remember back to that time? Like, what was it like for you? And I just want to talk about it for a minute because I think for me, it was a little bit like I just felt a little ashamed or a little embarrassed. Like for me personally, that I'm like, why can't I figure this out? Like, it it just doesn't make any intellectual sense when I compare what I'm able to do in other areas of my life. So I'm just curious, like what that was like for you. Did you talk to anyone else about it or was it all just kind of internal? It was both. And yeah, the <sighs> Shame is probably the only word that I can put to it because I also did a stretch of CrossFit because I, like I said, I do love to exercise and I found it to be really empowering. And for those of people that love CrossFit and that really enjoy that environment, I'm thrilled for them. And I enjoyed the CrossFit, the macro counting environment of that and the constant just revisiting that the coaches will do. Well, if you're not losing weight, if you're not losing fat off of your body, then you need to work harder. You need to work harder at the exercise. You need to work harder at your macros. Oh, we're going to just tweak your macros. So partly I, this is, you know, I, it's not that long ago, I was still counting calories. I mean, we're only talking four months ago that I was still counting calories, maybe not, maybe only three months ago. The macro counting, that was several years ago, but I just remember that feeling of like failure, shame and failure, like perceivably other people can do this perceivably and I just cannot. And maybe I can do it for a little while. And then the second you loosen that white knuckle grip, it all goes off the rails again. I mean, that's, yeah, it's that shame and failure I think is most prevalent for me. Yeah. And I think that's what we're taught a lot, too, just in society. It's like, oh, if you're carrying extra weight, like I used to think I was lazy. Well, I'm like, well, to fix that, I should just do more. And it's just the most exhausting hamster wheel cycle. So these last couple of weeks, then, if we kind of fast forward to the last couple of weeks when you've been recovering, what's it been like for you not being able to exercise in the way you're used to? It's been such a strange shift. It's like I live in an alternate dimension right now. That's kind of what it feels like because it's like I'm following, you know, my hunger signals as best I can as I'm learning to do that more, really focusing on the hydration part so that I'm drinking enough because I do know that my hunger 
oftentimes, or my thirst comes out as hunger. So I have to really be careful with that one. And I'm not able to exercise. And I go on the scale. It's like the scale is just going down. And I'm like, what's happening here? (laughs) Seriously, what, what is happening here? And I have notes like in my workbook with a WTF above my weight (laughs) with a question mark because I'm just like, how is this possible? Like I'm, I'm not starving to death. I'm not running five miles a day or, you know, doing an hour of CrossFit or whatever the obsessive thing is of the, of the month. Right. And the scale is ticking downward and I'm eating things that make me feel good. I'm eating as close, like I'm still learning hunger, like hunger levels, because since I've never, I've never in my life have I eaten according to a hunger level. It's always been my calories will allow me to eat this and that's what I eat or the amount I have exercised will allow me to eat this amount. So that is what I eat or I'm at my parents' house and this is, it's dinner time. This is what's in front of us. You eat and then we're good. So it has been like this, it literally does at times feel like I'm living in an alternate dimension. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Right. And yep. Especially when you've struggled for so long, I will still have people tell me who kind of they don't really know my journey or they don't they don't know kind of like, you know, the mindset that I have. And they're like, oh, I could just never, you know, give up. And they'll say, I could just never give up X, Y and Z or like you must work out all the time or like, right, we just project our own perceptions onto other people. And I used to I used to totally do that, too. I used to look at what I would perceive as like naturally thin women and be like, that must just be so hard. Like you must be working at this all the time. And then when you start to have this experience, and it's a very normal experience that people have, where your brain is like, it's trying to figure out, it's trying to make sense almost of like a new reality that just feels like almost magical or like, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I don't know. So what would you say to someone who's like, okay, yeah, it does sound magical, like not, not real. I don't know that, you know, and I have some friends that I think could really benefit from the content. One in particular, I said, you know, just go listen to the podcast, just start there and Mm -hmm. see if some of what she is saying, because she's, she's a young mom. She just had her fourth baby a year ago. And, you know, she's on that mindset of goes to the gym every morning before the kids are going. And, you know, she's like, I'm, I'm making sure I'm not, you know, overeating on calories. And I'm just like, stop, just please go listen to the podcast. You just never know. It might be, I said, the tools I have learned so far have been very meaningful to me and have, have met me at a point in my journey mentally towards living the ideal life that I envision for myself. But to have this conversation with other people, it does, it almost feels like hocus pocus. (laughs) I know. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, where do we start? (laughs) Yeah. Because I don't know, because so many people truly, truly, truly believe that they are not meant to be naturally thin. Like I come from a big boned family or everybody in my family is overweight or, you know, or the only way that people in my family keep weight off is through smoking cigarettes. I mean, that's not an uncommon thing for my generation is they still have parents that smoke. And that's the only way their parents maintain thinness is through smoking. You know, so I don't know. It's an interesting concept because I come from a family that actually are naturally thin. And I have because of unusually high amount of anxiety as a child and then also having very domineering social structure in our family never being able to have that personal license to say, I'm not hungry. I don't want that. It's like, you know, my mom was the very typical Midwestern mom is that you had a bad day at school. Here's a cookie. Was it, a you know, what were you uncomfortable? Like, because, you know, the, the school Christmas program didn't go well, have a piece of pie. You know, it's not, are you hungry? It's here's food to placate you or here's food to cover up emotion. Like we don't need to feel our emotions. We're just going to swallow them. Yeah. Uh, you know, so a lot of my friends are in that headspace, especially those in my generation, you know, that we're in that over 50 age group or even late 40s, early 50s of, you know, this is really a tremendous path of discovery. And then you add to it for me, perimenopause slash menopause, I'm kind of like in that in-between cycle. Mm-hmm. 
And there's so much messaging out there about, you know, you can't lose weight in menopause or you're going to gain an excessive amount of weight in perimenopause and then you're never going to get it back off again. And I'm like, um, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> hocus pocus. Yeah. Yeah. So, I live in fairyland where that woo. maybe is just not true. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that there's going to be people as I get closer to my naturally thin self in this journey that are going to, I know they're going to ask me and I, I'm not sure how I'm going to have that conversation in a meaningful way to them, other than to say, here's the website, here's the podcast. This is this is where I started my journey. Go take a look. See if it'll work for you. I don't yeah. know. Because I, I think you're right. There is a sense of it's almost like something has to touch your heart just right or like touch your own personal journey because you can easily articulate calories and into that's like an intellectual understanding, right? But to really have what I just call the naturally thin mindset or, you know, the mindset to live at your your ideal weight with ease. It's not an intellectual understanding. Yes, there's, of course, an intellectual piece, right? But it like it has to just touch you in a different way, yep. Yep. I think, and touch what you want for yourself and your life and be able to like reflect in on why you maybe aren't where you want and have some of that honesty with yourself, which I think also is a reason that some people just in my own kind of experience with other people is an obstacle for them that they just haven't overcome yet to be able to look inward and be like, oh, it is all me, which is the best news yeah. ever, because if it's yeah. you, then you get to, you know, if if you're the reason you're not at the weight you want, then you get to be the reason you are at the weight you want. And I'm curious if you have anything else to say about being in that stage of your life between perimenopause and menopause. I've had people throughout the course of my life, especially since in the last several years when I have been at my naturally thin weight. And, you know, people would say, well, you're going to, you know, you're going to be working all the time. You're never going to, you know, how are you going to exercise? You're never going to keep weight off. Or, you know, then it was like, well, you're going to have a kid. And then it was like, well, but then you're going to have two kids. And then you're never going to be able to lose weight after kids. Or you're never going to be able to lose weight after babies. And then now, you know, now people are like, well, just wait. Once you hit 40, the weight just keeps crawling up. And then they're like, just wait. You know, it's always like some some other thing. And now for me, I mean, I just have no worries at all about living in my ideal body and in, in a body that feels really good, no matter the stage I'm in. But I'm just curious if you have any other thoughts on that in your experience and just kind of what you see from other people. Because if you believe that you're going to go through a certain stage of life and you're never going to lose the weight, then you never. will never lose the weight. So there's a couple pieces of this, and this is part of, I think, why working myself through the weeks of the program, I'm really taking my time because I remember early on in one of the pieces, it was like, if you're just going to blitz through this, you're just basically going to go through the content and you're not going to work through the process. This will be no different than any other diet you've ever done. So I've really been taking my time through it and trying to understand the hunger signals. And what I have noticed because of the tremendous hormone shift that happens at this phase of life is how much hunger signals can be falsely changed, interpreted by hormone levels is you get this shift is like the estrogen, the progesterone is all over the place. And one minute you're hungry and the next minute you're not, or you're hungry for something you've never been quote unquote hungry before, but that's a craving, right? So it's not a hunger, you know, so I'm learning that piece now too. So it's like, I am drinking from the fire hose all at once here, trying to figure all of this out. And I think that that is why. So one of the reasons why so many women have a tendency to gain weight during that perimenopause menopause stage is because of the hormone levels are giving us false signals is they're craving signals they're not actually hunger signals and we have to start to learn or we should be learning different ways to kind of tease those pieces apart you know granted yeah but this is also a big phase of our life for many women where just like i was saying early on Kids are off to out of high school, off to college. You have that empty nest. You have all this other time on your hands. You're not running from sports event to school activity to possibly, you know, like a social activity. You're not this extremely busy person. And then you hit kind of that mid-management or mid-level career phase where things also change there. So it's like a cavalcade, right? I really think that 
the biggest piece for me on the perimenopause menopause has been busting through that myth that it's going to take even more restriction and more exercise. And if I see one more message about, and this is important, strength training is important for women, don't get me wrong. But the only way I'm going to lose weight in perimenopause and menopause is if I just like hammer away at the strength training. I'm just like, no, more like work harder, work more, work longer at this mission is not like, that's not for me figuring out what's happening inside my head and understanding what my body really wants. That's what's for me right now. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole, I just want to cringe every time I hear it when people are like, I just, you know, I really got to like hit the gym and I got to, you know, kind of like you're saying, like a very strength training focus, which again, I am, I love being fit. I love feeling yeah. strong. I do strength training. And then it's like, and then just the obsession with the protein. I just, I just like, oh, I just want to like scream <laughs> because it, I can see it's like their wheels are just turning about. Like, it's like this constant, like someone in, in Naturally Thin for Life, she used to call it like Tetris. Like you're just always playing Tetris with like the exercise and the, and the protein and the macros and, and trying to get it all in. And, you know, I, someone said something to me recently about labels and I just realized for the first time, I was like, oh, that's so interesting. I don't really read labels at all anymore other than to see if it, I'm like, oh, do I want to just, you know, check some ingredients or, you know, look for something, but I don't really like look at the calories. And I forgot almost like that takes so much time, even just those little things. And then being in your head and be like, should I eat it? Should I not eat it? Should I eat it? Should I not eat it? And all of that, like even from that initial moment of looking at a label and looking at the calories to determine whether or not you should eat it versus like the ingredients to get to know your body. It just perpetuates this crazy yeah. cycle. One of the biggest pieces I noticed like within the first two weeks of the program has been the amount of mental freedom. I don't think, okay, if I have this many calories for breakfast, then I can have this many calories for lunch and this many calories for dinner, right? It's, I don't have to plan every meal, every bite, every morsel of food that comes in my mouth. And I don't have to read every label. I don't have to weigh every gram of food. I don't have to get the scale out, the measuring cups out, the measuring spoons out. I don't have to do all that stuff. If I want to, to just say, you know, this is how, you know, just so I know, okay, if I put a tablespoon of this on it, yeah, it tastes good. If I put two tablespoons on, no, that's not so good. You know, if it's something like that, sure. But just the mental release of not obsessively being down in the trenches of diet culture has been just phenomenal. You know, I'm Part of my story, so to speak, is that despite being very young, my husband is also only mid 50s, but he has a degenerative spinal condition. And so I'm a caregiver and I'm lucky I have a home office and my job allows me to work from home four days a week. But that also means that, you know, I could easily fall into that trap of eating more for comfort because we didn't sleep last night or it was a stressful doctor's appointment or they don't have a medication ready. And, you know, you're juggling all of this extra stuff. And it's really easy to get into that, that poor me mindset of I'm going to use food to cover up these feelings or to, to mask what's what I really should be dealing with. And that's, you know, that piece of learning how to deal with what's really going on versus just covering it up with food. That's why I'll be on this journey for a little while yet. <laughs> yeah. And so what's it been like for you when you have those hard moments and you aren't using food? It's definitely a learning process. Sometimes I get it right. And sometimes I fall, you know, back towards those older patterns and luckily, I, I have been successful in catching myself about midway through those, you know, when I when I realize, wait a minute, this is this is not the path I want to take to get to the, you know, the naturally thin life I want to lead. It's been interesting because now what I have found I have to do is find not only am I like recognizing what's happening in, in my heart, in my head whether it be stress or overwhelm or anxiety or just exhaustion, most of it truthfully is just exhaustion. I'm just tired. And 
you know, in the past, just eat something to get that little spurt of energy just to keep going a little bit more, just go harder a little bit more and get to the end of the day. Well, now it's okay. I need to recognize what is happening and how do I, so if I'm not going to use food, what am I going to do? Can I, can I take a quick nap? Can I get outside and get some fresh air? Can I, you know, what, what can I do without food is part of that journey. Because if I'm sitting here and I'm like, you know, I really want to have a handful of chocolate covered cherries, then why am I hungry? No. Then what's the problem? Well, I'm kind of stressed out because, you know, X, Y, and Z. And it really, it's a matter of figuring out what is happening, but then what am I going to use in place of food? And this is a whole new process. Like, like seriously, I have to start, I have to make a list. Okay. What am I going to do in place of food to help me through this feeling that I'm having or this emotion or this moment? Setting up some of those pieces in advance, you know, because if we're going to go to a medical appointment for him, he is, doesn't drive much at all. So I have to drive him for everything. So if I'm driving him to a medical appointment and his procedure is an hour, two hours long, what am I going to do in between to acknowledge and manage my stress? And it used to be, well, I'm going to do my job with my mobile device. You know, I'm going to do, I'm going to check email with my work phone and I'm going to snack on a bag of chips or whatever in the vehicle while I wait until they call and say, come back in and get him or something like that. And now it's like, you know what, I'll take, I'll take my shoes and I'll go for a walk. I'll listen to a Mm -hmm. podcast. Maybe I'll just sit in the vehicle and take a nap because I'm probably tired and stressed out and I'm placating stuff with food and work and, and it's time to live a different life. Yeah. And right. It is. It's just so much more than the food, right? The food is just a symptom and it's, It's like exactly what you're saying. I think a lot of people fear that if they take food away, even if it's not binging or it's not a lot of, you know, kind of comfort eating as some stereotypes that we have, but it's just like life is stressful sometimes. And for those of us that maybe have a little more propensity towards anxiety and overwhelm and stress, and we can, you know, happen to feel that maybe more than other people it can just be so easy to, you know, grab for a snack and have a couple of nuts and have a little bit of this. And even if it's healthy food and it's like when you take that away, but you don't have the tools to be with yourself, to get to know yourself, to process emotion, to generate different emotion, to understand your mind, right? You need those tools to be able to make it something that creates that freedom and that peace. And years ago when I was working one-on-one with people, I used to work with a woman and she said she would see a lot of people that would have either the sleeve or they would have bariatric surgery. And she would say, you know, but they're not given the tools. So they're just the grouchiest people ever because they haven't learned, right? They've taken their coping mechanism away and they haven't learned how to, you know, create the peace that they want internally. And so like, even when you were saying, you know, before about like Fridays, they used to be pizza Fridays and we used to, you know that used to be like our routine and and what we would do. So what, like, what do you do when you notice that for yourself? And you're like, oh, this used to be what we do. And it used to be fun and, you know, have an experience. And now I realize like the food doesn't taste so good. Yeah. Or feel so good. It's been a process of, okay, so do I, you know, do we want to have a different Friday night date night activity or do we like the meal part? And then we're just going to incorporate foods that make me feel better that he can still, you know, that he enjoys, or is it, we're going to just do a totally different thing. You know, we'll just grab a bite to eat at home like we always do, but then maybe we'll take a ride out to my husband has a 1940 Dodge truck. It's his hobby and it keeps him busy when he feels well enough to do things and we'll take the old truck for a ride and we'll go out to the lake and just sit there and you know watch the sunset over the water you know so there's simple things like that that is determining what's going to be the most meaningful to replace what's not working and you know because if what i have found of course is replacing like taking something I dearly love and replacing it with something else. If I don't dearly love the something else, (laughs) it's not going to work. It's going to be like, yeah, but what about that? You know, it's really as simple as that. And then 
if we would have pizza, most often we would bring it back here and we would, we have a beautiful covered porch and we would eat on the porch. It would be like a, a Friday night picnic, right? And then of course it involves maybe a beer or something. Well, through this process, I've also learned that alcohol at this phase in my life just doesn't make me feel good. It just doesn't. And so I've been experimenting with some of the new alcohol free, like sparkling. They look like a sparkling wine, but they're alcohol free. And so I've just been experimenting with some of those. And I'm like, these are really good. And this is really fun because it means I can have something if we're in a group setting that looks like other people having an alcoholic beverage. So I look like I'm just like everybody else. Nobody needs to, you know, whatever. And I can still participate in the fun. And so for right now, it's a nice Band-aid on the process of just not being like, no, I'm just going to sit here with my bottle of water, which for some people that might be perfect. They might be able to just sit there. For me, I just, I'm like, you know what? I don't want to just take everything away all at once and make every single change all at once. I'm one of those people that's got to do this part gradually in order for it to stick. (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's so important to recognize is like you're saying, you know, even with the pizza example, it's like understanding what you really enjoy about that experience and creating it in a way that also allows you to feel good, right? It's not like, oh, just like, don't do that and don't replace it with anything. It's like, how do I create a lifestyle that really works for me and that I really enjoy and also includes me feeling really good? Yeah. Yeah. It is such a journey. And there is, I remember an early piece that I listened to and it was like, you know, you look at the workbook and you look at the video checklist and, you know, like how many minutes are each one. And then I'm just like, do I have, can I spend a half an hour today? Can I, can I spend an hour today and, you know, get through a few videos, you know, how am I going to do that? And I remember, and then I would think, I have a lot more time on my hands now because I am not putting every calorie into an a my fitness pal app. I am not reading umpteen articles on the Noom app. I am not doing all these other things. I'm not obsessively tracking or I'm not obsessively like monitoring food and all of these things like, oh, well, can I eat yet? Can I eat yet? It's like, wait, am I hungry? You know, so it's like it's a whole nother way to do this. And And just determining how best to utilize my time is that, you know, it may look overwhelming when you when someone looks at the content in the video checklist. But boy, after the first like even week and you realize this doesn't take long at all compared to the old life. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's it what's it like for you as you go to implement some of those tools? Most of them I'm like it's I, I make a lot of notes. My my workbook is very messy. I'm very much a pencil or pen to paper person. Part of it is my age group, you know, but then the other part is I also have done enough reading and enough studying up to realize there's a, there's a good brain imprint process with physically writing stuff. And so, you know, as I'm working through the content and I'm making notes and a lot of times it's just as simple as if I do it first thing in the morning, then later, like maybe at lunchtime or if I have a break after work before all the other things start to come around, as I go back and I look at whatever content was that I went through in the workbook, you know, like whatever workbook pages it was for the video. And then I reread them because it allows me to to process them again because, I get bombarded with a lot like anybody else. We get bombarded with a lot in a day. And sometimes it's like my brain doesn't have time to latch on to everything it needs to right in that moment, which is why those, for me, the notes come in handy is that I can I can look back and I can read them. And then it's like, okay, wait. So this is the one I want to implement because the, the podcast of yours I listened to this morning on the walk talked about what are the ultimate possibilities? And what if you just put a question mark above your head and said, what if? And so what I plan to do, and I I actually made a quick note of it when I got home on a sticky note, is to put a question mark on a sticky note and put it in front of my seat at our dining room table where we eat every meal. If we're at home, we eat at the dining room table because we have a small house and it works. But I thought if that question mark is right there in front of me, is, you know, reminding me, what if, what if my ultimate goal and my ultimate you know, naturally thin self? What if that were true right now? What if I do everything that I know right now and keep working those pieces? So the implementation has really been, for me, just a consistent process of reminding and reaffirming 
why I'm here and what I'm doing is not because somebody else says I should eat one gram of protein per pound of body weight. It's this is what my body wants and what my body says is going to help it live its best life today. Yeah. And only you can know that. And I just, for me personally, it just was almost the most empowering shift that I was like, oh, I don't like, we don't actually need someone else to tell us how to eat. We might need to relearn how to listen to our body, but when you have that freedom, it just makes it so much more enjoyable to go throughout your day and then more enjoyable to eat. So have you noticed any difference in either your day at all when you're working or your time with your husband or just how you experience time and or relationships at all? Yeah, I would say that the what I've noticed with the time has been really just trying to shut off that mindset of if the clock says this, <laughs> that it's time to eat, mm-hmm. that that the clock is not my stomach. <laughs> the clock is not in charge of me. I'm the boss of me. Yeah. I'm a big girl now. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's really been that part of just you know, recognizing the timing and understanding that like if it's eight o'clock in the morning and I need to start my day and I'm not hungry, don't force myself to eat in the past. Always force Mm -hmm. myself, not, not force so much as no, not even a moment's thought of, am I actually hungry? No, it is seven 30. We start work at eight o'clock. We have to eat breakfast now. Mm -hmm. That gets our day going because you need this number of calories and this <laughs> this much protein to get through, right? Yeah. And so it it's really been that shift of understanding that, especially, and I say Americanized, but because other cultures really look at meals and timing and nutrition much differently, especially when you look at like the Italian and French culture and how they view meals and when those meals happen. And so I look at the American culture and it's like, you know, breakfast at seven, lunch at noon, dinner at six, because the part that I'm still struggling with is what if I'm not hungry at six o'clock? How do I figure this out? Because because I go to bed fairly early because I get up fairly early and it's like, okay, well, I can't have dinner at seven o'clock at night because I'm in bed and asleep by nine because I'm up at five because I'm a morning person and I enjoy that. Right. So it's like, Oh, so how do I, (laughs) that's the part I haven't figured out yet, but it, but it really is an amazing lesson on, or, or just a recognition of how much of a slave to a clock I have been. And, you know, just part of it's how I was raised. And then just part of it is lifestyle too. And just the American work culture is, you know, if you're in a meeting, you get a lunch break from noon to one. Like, what if I'm not hungry? Am I supposed to like shut the camera off and eat in the background? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And so how much weight have you lost in the last seven weeks? In the Do last you know? seven weeks, I weighed, of course, weighed this morning and I'm down almost eight pounds. So I just like want like for everyone to hear that too, right? It's like, okay, so I've been recovering. I haven't been exercising. I'm just like implementing at my pace, right? And Like you're losing weight as you're figuring things out, right? I think so often, especially like very driven type A people, it's why I have that video in the start here section is like, it's more important that you implement as you learn than like you're saying, like blitz through all the videos, because if you just do that, right, then you're not implementing and you're not learning as you go. You don't need to have it all figured out in order to start losing weight. You figure it out as you're losing weight, right? That's part of the process. And so I just love that you shared that, right? That you're still figuring out like what evenings look like for you. You're still figuring out different hunger levels. You're still figuring out, right? If you have hormonal cravings and if that's hunger and you're losing weight simultaneously, that's really how it's meant to be, I think, to get to know our bodies is there is some trial and error. And so I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, but I know when we're when we're dieting, we just want it to be like a straight line plunge down because it's so torturous. We don't want to deal with anything. Right. And so sometimes people will even start the program and they they want it to be perfect, you know, right away and only ever lose weight, you know, straight line. And that's just not how our bodies are designed. But it's also not how you learn how to live this way for the rest of your life. Yeah, no. And and that's, 
a hundred percent. What I've been working towards is that consistent reminder. One of the hardest pieces for me every single night is weigh myself at night because diet culture is like, never do that because you will be three to four pounds, five pounds heavier at night. So my diet brain that just will not shush, especially at night after a long, stressful day or just exhausted. And it's like, just shush. Just stand on there, write the number down, and just shush about it. So that that has been a big piece of that, you know. And part of the reason why I started the process when I started it was because I thought, you know what, I've got more time on my hands right now because I'm not going out for a run every morning and I'm not going for a bike ride in the evening, even if it's just a casual ride around town or or doing some of these things. And it's like. So by by knowing that and then being like, you know what, I'm going to give this a shot because what's the worst that's going to happen in my brain? The worst it's at, it's another diet and I'm going to fail. OK, well, definitely been down that path a few times. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and I mean, obviously, I lost pretty consistent weight for the first few weeks and then the past two weeks because I had knee surgery two weeks ago. Of course, my weight went up because they pump your leg, well, any part of you, full of fluid and you're on, you know, you're on a, a anti-inflammatory You're and some people have to take, you know, for some pretty serious pain meds. And so I knew my weight was going to kind of do this during these past two weeks. And it did. But then today it's, you know, right back down to the lowest level since I started the program seven weeks, seven, eight weeks ago. So, you know, I'm extremely happy and I know that this is the absolute best journey that I have ever been on or invested in myself because I told myself at the start of 2023 that I was going to do some very meaningful things for myself because for the past five years, it's really been a lot of effort towards keeping my husband alive and as healthy and as comfortable and out of as much pain as we can considering his issues. And so in February, I had substantial sinus surgery. I'd never breathed through my nose in my entire life and won't recommend that recovery for anyone unless it will change your life. So now I'm smelling more, I'm tasting more, I'm breathing. I can actually breathe through my nose. I'm sleeping better at night, you know, and then it's like, okay, well, now I got to have this knee fixed because I'm 52 and I can't check my ego at the door and I go do cardio kickboxing. <laughs> so, and I just did a full send on that cardio kickboxing. Lots of fun. Definitely should have paired it back just a little bit. You know, and so then this is part of that. Let's let's build the life that I really envisioned for myself for that next half of because just like you with the longevity in my family, I fully envisioned to live to a hundred. Totally. And I am not going to say to my granddaughter <laughs> at 90 some years old, I can't drink that because I'm going to get fat. Yeah. And yet she was this itty bitty little teeny yeah. tiny lady. I mean, she was yeah. just very petite and it broke my heart. Yeah. It, it, it literally, it broke my heart for her and for me mm. because I'm like, This is so wrong. This is what the diet culture, the diet industry, the diet mindset has done to us. It has made a 90 some year old woman who is frail and should really get key nutrition afraid. Yeah. So afraid of food. So much fear around food. It's just, it is, it's so sad. Yeah. And, and like, that's that anger piece where I'm like, you know, that's in the past. We're building a better life. We're building a better journey forward, mm-hmm. you know, and it really is a journey. Each day yeah. is a journey. It's it. We have no idea what tomorrow is. We can't fix what happened yesterday is today's the journey. So yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, in the last, you know, couple of minutes that we have, is there anything else that's on your mind that you want to share? If you want to just anything from your own journey, or if you imagine someone listening, something that you would want them to know. There was one piece that we haven't talked about and you I don't even know where you mentioned it in the content. And you had said that the feelings of overwhelm and feelings of anxiety, feelings of stress, those are a choice. That hit me like just a full ton of bricks onto the floor. And I was like, oh my gosh, it is. Because in, you know, with with everything that we deal with here in my house, overwhelm, stress, and anxiety 
had really started to pile on top of me. I'd been working on getting control of that the past five years, you know, through a lot of different things with a lot of different resources and and professionals in particular. But when you said that that's a choice, I don't know why that hit home so hard for me because it, it always felt like it was out of my control. But then I'm like, wait a minute. No, she's right. It's not. It starts up here. It starts in my own brain and in my own body. I can choose to be overwhelmed, to be stressed out and be anxious or whatever it is about whatever situation, or I can choose a different path that made so much difference in my life. And I just want to thank you that that particular part for me, that made a huge difference in my life. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it is so, and for me, it was always with anxiety. It was like when I was like, whoa, I'm creating this. And also it's okay that I am right now. Like, right. It doesn't mean that you never feel stress or overwhelm or anxiety, but it's just like, oh, like even just there's a sense of peace for me personally that I'm like, oh, I'm feeling anxious and I'm the one creating it and it's okay. Like I don't actually need to change it in this moment. It's like you do, you just feel so much more in control of your own experience. Yep. Yeah. And you don't need to eat a bag of chips to cover it up. Yes, totally. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. I cannot wait for other people to to hear and I wish you just so much continued success. Thank you so much. I love being part of the program. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Friends, if you are loving what you are learning here on the podcast, you have to come check out my Naturally Thin for Life program. It is my on-demand lifetime access program where I teach you brand new concepts not taught here on the podcast. And I will walk you through exactly how to implement all of the tools I teach you here so that they become just a part of you. You will learn exactly how to understand your specific brain and your specific body so that you become naturally thin for the rest of your life and you no longer struggle with your weight. Inside of the Naturally Thin for Life program, you can also receive live help so that you consistently make progress and reach your goal. I will teach you how to accelerate your naturally thin journey in a sustainable way so that the change becomes permanent. The best part is that it's risk-free. You either love it or I will give you your money back. If you are ready to finally be naturally thin for life, join us at lauradixoncoaching.com forward slash work with me. That's L-A-U-R-A D-I-X-O-N coaching.com and click on the work with me tab. I cannot wait to see you there.